right, don't forget to bring the back here. Back here, head All right, and yeah. those down, everybody give them. who want to be confirmed but they can't make it to the classes so we're going to do a videotape and put it on a DVD and they'll be able to watch the information at home and uh, that's the good news is they'll understand what confirmation is all about bad news is they won't be here to ask questions so they'll have to ask their questions later uh, help yourself to as many donuts as you want let me tell you what we're going to do today we're going to start Basically, right now, <clears throat> every hour, we're going to take a break. We're going to give you all five, ten minutes, go to the bathroom, go get something to drink, that sort of thing, stretch your legs. <clears throat> At lunchtime, uh, I'm going to have some food here. I know two of you have food, but um, I'm going to have uh, some food brought in so that we can have lunch, and we're going to eat and continue to talk while we're eating, because we don't have a lot of spare time today. By 2 o'clock today, we'll be done. All right? And um, you will have received pretty much all the information that I've been giving to the other people. Um, if at any time during what we're doing today, if at any time you have any questions, you just ask. This is supposed to be at a time when we talk with each other, not me talking to you. So if there's something that you don't understand or you want to know a little bit more about, you just ask me. If there's a subject that comes up and you want to ask a question, but you don't want to ask it in front of anybody, then just during one of the breaks, just let me know that you want to talk to me about something, okay? Um, <clears throat> let me start with prayer, and then let me tell you what, uh, what subjects we're going to talk about while we're going to talk about it. So let's pray. Most gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for all that you do for us, for your many blessings, for blessings that take our breath away, blessings we are unaware of, blessings we take for granted. We ask you, Lord, just to be with us today as we study uh, the things that you have given us to know more clearly who you are, to understand who you call us to be and to be able to strengthen our relationship with you so that we can go out into the world to love others as you have loved us. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Um, let me tell you about confirmation. Why do you think we do confirmation in, in the Episcopal Church? You like understand what it's what it's church to understand um, what the differences are and how to um, do stuff. Okay. Isn't it like when you agree when you got baptized with what your parents did? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it free when you couldn't? Yeah, in the Episcopal Church, there are some denominations like uh, Baptist, Church of God, and other denominations where they do not baptize. Babies. Is that weird that it's called baptism? It's, it's what? Is that weird that it's called baptism? Uh huh. Um, in in other churches, they want the children to grow up and get to be there um, twelve years old or older to make the decision for themselves, and then they come down and they ask to be baptized, and they're baptized for the first time when they're young um, young people. Uh, in the Episcopal Church, in the Roman Catholic Church, and the Lutheran Church, specifically those three, uh, we baptize babies. Now, we also baptize adults. If adults have never been baptized, we baptize adults or teenagers. But <clears throat> it's a very common practice in the Episcopal Church that we baptize um, babies. I was baptized when I was eight weeks old. Many of you were probably baptized about the same time. And as you mentioned, 
our parents and our godparents take on vows that say that we'll be brought up in the church, that we'll be taught about Jesus, and uh, we'll try to have a, a relationship with God. And when we become 12 years or older in the Episcopal Church, we offer you this class of confirmation. Uh, a priest will baptize you, but only a bishop in the Episcopal Church can confirm you. So that's why we do this maybe every year, every year and a half, because that's when the bishop comes. And now it's your time to study the things about the church that builds a foundation for the things that you'll learn as you grow older. Okay? So the things that we're going to study today are the Book of Common Prayer. That's why you have one in front of you. <clears throat> we're going to study the Bible. We're going to study the sacraments, and I'm going to tell you what those are later. We're going to study the Trinity. We're going to study the two natures of Christ. We're going to study briefly the creed and briefly the history of the Episcopal Church. So those are the things that I have been teaching as a priest for now going on 17 years. <clears throat> I think if you have a, a basic understanding of those things, then as you learn other things, um, they'll make sense. So, any questions about... Yes, sir. What are my fellow students' names? Oh, well, let's do that. <laughs> let's just go around here. Uh, Kira. Kira. Sydney. Oh, it's too slow. Come on. What was it? Sydney. Sydney. Emma. Emma. Zach. Zach. And I'm Rick. Rick. And I'm Sean. Okay. Thank you for that, Rick. <coughs> All right. Let's um, let's start with this book of common prayer. Um, this book of this particular book of common prayer was written in 1970, but the very first book of common prayer was written back in the 1500s. Henry VIII was the king of England, and um, there were churches in, in in Europe that were breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to talk about that later when we talk about the history of the Episcopal Church. But when those churches started breaking away, Henry VIII uh, didn't really want to break away for theological reasons. He wanted to break away because he was married to a woman. He didn't want to be married to her anymore. And um, what's, what was going on was that she was not able to um, give birth to a, a son, to a male heir. And uh, when he had tried for several years to, to have a child who was a, a, a boy, and it wasn't working. He wanted to divorce her and marry somebody else. He thought it was her fault, and it turned out not to be her fault. But he didn't want a divorce, and he asked the Pope for a divorce because that's in a Roman Catholic church. That's what you do. And the Pope said, "No, I'm not. I'm not going to give you a divorce." The reason he said that is because the Pope was friends with the uh, King of Spain, and the King of Spain was the cousin of the woman Henry was married to. And so he did not want to upset the king of Spain. And Henry said, well, if you're not going to give me a divorce, then I, we're going to break away from the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm going to declare myself the head of the church here in England, and um, I'll give myself a divorce. And so he just started a brand new church. And that church was called the Church of England. Okay? And it started in the mid-1500s. Now, when he broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, all of the worship in the in the um, in the Roman Catholic Church was all in Latin. Anybody here speak Latin? Do you? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't speak I don't speak too many languages very well. Uh, I speak a little bit of German, a little bit of Spanish, um, but. Can you imagine coming to church and sitting there for two hours and listening to somebody talk in a language that you don't understand? Every week, year after year, would that be fun? No. <laughs> would you get anything out of it? No, I don't think so. And so uh, Henry looked at one of the bishops that he had in England, and he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that service that we do every Sunday, 
the one that's in Latin, I want you to write a book in English, and I want us to do our worship services in English now so that everybody knows what we're talking about. And the Bible had never been translated into English either. Have you ever heard of the King James Version? <coughs> that was the first translation of the Bible into English. And so the bishop's name was Thomas Cranmer, and in 1549 he, he wrote the very first book of Common Prayer. And I've got a copy of uh, that original book of Common Prayer. I've got it down in my office. There were several things I meant to bring up here. I'll bring them up during the break. He wrote the very first one, and, and it's pretty small. It doesn't have everything that we have in here now. But it had, um, it had morning prayer, it had evening prayer, it had communion, it had a service for people getting married and a service for people dying. And um, he was a pretty good first try. But there were some things that some other priests and bishops didn't like. So three years later, he wrote another Book of Common Prayer. He took what he had and changed some things. <coughs> and people didn't like that one either, so six years later he wrote another one. What I want you to understand is many of the prayers and many, many of the services that we do are pretty much like they were 450 years ago. That's how long we've been doing the prayers and stuff that we've been doing. I just did a, serve, I just did a funeral um, just today, Saturday. I did a funeral two days ago, and people who are not Episcopalian came up and said, what a beautiful service. And I said, yes, that service has been around for 450 years. Uh, we know a good thing when we have it. And um, so uh, this, this is a very historical document, and, and it really it has been designed to help us pray and worship about the things that we believe. Okay. Now, if we were Spanish people here in the United States, there's one of these written in Spanish instead of English, so that the Spanish community could do the service in their own language. If you were to go to um, Hong Kong, there's a book of common prayer there, and it's written in their language. If you were to go to New Zealand, there's a book of common prayer there, and it's written in their language. Now, when you go to different countries, things are a little different because <coughs> they follow the customs in their country. But um, they all basically have the same thing. They all have opening prayers. They all have reading of scriptures. They all have um, confession. They all have creed. They all have communion. So the basic way that we worship across the world um, is the same. Now, I told your mother that we've got six things to cover in five hours. So one of the things I'm going to kind of jump away from the prayer book. We're going to come to this. Um, I'm going to cover this real quick. We come from the Church of England. Okay. Now when the people of England were in England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland, that was a good thing because the prayers there said we pl pledge allegiance to the king and so on and so forth. But then a lot of people started moving and when they found America, they started coming over here and coming to church. <clears throat> Anybody remember we had a big war between us and England? Yeah. What was that called? Revolution. Yeah. And can we stay the Church of England anymore? Nope. Nope. Had to find a new name. So we came up with a name that we are the Episcopal Church. Anybody know where the word Episcopal comes from? Episcopate. That's the, that's the root word, Episcopate. It's a Latin word which means overseer, and Episcopate means bishop. So we are a church of bishops. We are the Episcopal Church. And who's our bishop in our diocese? Anybody know? Porter. Porter was our bishop for the last 11 years, but he just retired. And you guys are going to meet our brand new bishop. His name's Jose McLaughlin. Okay? And uh, you're going to be the first people in our church that's going to be confirmed by him. <clears throat> now, when, it's important to understand this because this is, this is something that I think makes us very unique 
in, in America. The people who fought for our independence are the people who created the way that our nation is governed. We have a president and we have a house, of, uh, we have the Senate, and we have the House of Representatives. Now, I had this over here, but let me show you what we have. The same people who established our government are the same people who established the Episcopal Church. We, in the Episcopal Church, we have a presiding bishop. We have close to 200 bishops in the United States, but one is elected to be the person who leads us, okay? So we have a presiding bishop just like we have a president. We have a house of bishops just like we have a house of senate. So all the bishops in the United States go every three years to the general convention. General convention happens every three years. The house of bishops gather together and they talk about things, they vote on things. We have a house of representatives which are clergy, priests like me, and lay people, people like you. But for our diocese, we don't send everybody in our diocese to general convention. We send two clergy and two lay people. And, um, and they go there and they vote on things. For example, the prayer book that was before this one was 1928. And when they decided that the language in 1928 needed to be updated, we still had the these and the thous and uh, that sort of thing. I said, we, we, we want to get away from the these and the thous. We want to put you and us and we and, and that kind of modern day language in. Well, when we wanted to change this, it had to come before the general convention. The bishops voted on it. The representatives voted on it. It had to pass both places. And once it was approved, they said, well, let's make sure. Let's wait another three years and let's vote on this again with another group of people just to see if we really want to do this. So this was, it took us six years to approve our brand new prayer book. And if we, if we update this one, if we change it, we're going to go through that again. Now here's what I want you to understand. <clears throat> Around the world, there are 33 different groups like the Episcopal Church in the United States. There's a group here in the United States, there's a group in Canada, there's a group in Central America, there's a group in Africa, there's a group in South America, there's a group in Australia, there's a group in Turkey, there's a group of Anglicans all over the world. And we say that we're Anglican because the word Anglican means that we go back to our Anglican roots, which come from England. There are 33 groups in the United States We have 1.9 million Episcopalians, okay? Back when I was growing up was a time when we had the most Episcopalians. We had 3 million, 0.2. We had 3.2 million Episcopalians. Now we have 1.9, so are we, are we growing or are we declining? Declining. Yeah, we're declining. Anybody have any idea why we're declining? Why are we losing people? Well, some people might, um, I feel like the new one that people like move to, um, if you like, make up a new one, like we did when we left England, um, like if somebody doesn't like the old ones to make a new, mm -hmm. they could do that. Well, uh, some people do leave the Episcopal Church and go start a new church. We had that happen here in town about 10 years ago, and we've got a brand new church that started from people of this church and people of the other Episcopal church from All Saints. But that's, that's part of the reason. Part of the reason is because um, in 1950s, 1960s, we had just gone through a big war, World War I and World War II. And people were concerned about where the world was going, all these big wars and people dying. And so a lot of people were coming to church trying to find out where God is and how God was going to save us. We haven't had those big wars anymore. We've had a lot of little, little wars and people still are dying, but we haven't had world wars like we have been. And people have a good life and they're not concerned about God as much. So people, for one reason, have just 
quit coming. They're getting busy with, with life and they're saying, we don't need to go to church. Another reason is very social, that women, young girls, do not work in the workforce except for baby being nurses or secretaries or something like that. But they weren't your typical doctors and lawyers and um, there were many teachers, but the, the women started working more and it, it, they were starting to work outside the house. They were always working at home, but now they were working out in, in the world. And so when the women started working, there was less of a reason to come to church because if you, if you weren't working, you came to church on Sunday to meet your friends. But now when they're working, they're seeing their friends all week long, so there's less um, energy to go to church on Sunday. So our, the Episcopal Church is not the only church that's in decline. The Roman Catholics are declining, the Methodists are declining, the Baptists are declining, non-denominational are declining. A lot of, all the major denominations are losing people. As a church, we need to try to reach out to people and start reading them. 70 million Anglican people. Out of these 30 million in Canada, Central America, uh, Australia, all these people, we have 33 groups. We have 1.9 in the United States, but we have 70 million people who go to church and worship like us around the world. So that's a pretty good size group, isn't it? 70 million, that's a lot. All right. Um, so I've covered really the, the history of the Episcopal Church. I can do a little bit more uh, later if anybody wants to, to cover that. Let's go ahead and start looking at what's in here. Before you open it, I want you to pick up the prayer book and look at it with the pages. Look, look towards the pages. Anybody have any idea what part of the, the prayer book we use the most? Okay, you see a little line in the, in the pages? <laughs> All right. That's our Sunday morning worship. That's Holy Communion. The Episcopal Church decided many years, when I was growing up, we did um, morning prayer three Sundays of the month, and we did communion once a month. And then in the 70s, when this book was cre created, the Episcopal Church decided we were going to be more sacramentally uh, centered. So now we do communion every Sunday. And the part that most of us use is between 320, uh, 323 and 400. And that's all the pages of the part. Uh, but what I, what I want you all to know is what else is in here. Okay? Here's the good news. I, I didn't mention this when we first started. You're not going to have to memorize anything. You're not going to have to recite anything. You're not going to have to take a test. There's no pass or fail. You're just going to be invited to stay here today. We're going to talk about these things, and when you're done, if you want to be confirmed by the bishop, then you'll be confirmed. And nobody's going to ask you any questions other than, do you want to be confirmed? And you will say, yes, we do. Okay? All right. So let's, let's start at the beginning. If you open up the prayer book to the very first part, you're going to find a table of contents. Okay. <clears throat> like most books, this has a table of contents. And whenever you want to find something in here, this is the, this is the place to start. So if I were to ask you, where are, um, where's the service for Holy Baptism? What would you tell me? page 299, and that's what we would turn to, and that's where we would start. All right, there's some, um, there's some introductory words here. Um, I want you to turn to page 15, the church calendar. And uh, I'll bring a copy, I'll, I'll bring a church calendar up here after the break. But uh, this church calendar tells you all the special days that we as Episcopalians observe during the year. So for example, when is Christmas? 25th. December 25th. 25th, okay. When is Easter? Um, uh, April, uh, depends on, it's in April, but it depends on there. which um, 
Sometimes it's like earlier, sometimes it's like Okay, well, let's read. Um, well, actually, some people say that it's the Christ really wasn't born in December because the um, shepherds wouldn't be in their fields okay. in the winter, and so he might not have been born on Christmas Day. That's a very good point. Um, I don't really believe that. But I guess it makes sense scientifically, but... Well, we don't actually know when Jesus was born. We're going to come back to the calendar, but that's an excellent point. Why do we have? Why do we celebrate Christmas December twenty fifth? We don't know when Jesus was born. There was no records. There wasn't a hospital that you went to. Isn't it just when? Isn't it like the twenty fifth is when all the people came to see Jesus? Well, the reason that uh, we use the twenty fifth of December is. Have you noticed that the daylight during the day is a lot shorter than it was during the summer? What times does it get dark during the summer? Like five. Or no, like, no, that's like eight. But then yeah, now it takes like six. Like nine o'clock during the summer. The longest day during the summer is June 21st. June 21st. Yeah, June 21st. It's the longest daylight that we experience. What do you think the shortest daylight is? Is December 22nd, first or second, somewhere around there. So December, in, in December 21st, 22nd, used to be a day when people who did not worship our God, which is God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they worshiped a different God, and they worshiped their God during a time of darkness. And the time of darkness in, in the world on the calendar was somewhere in late December. And when we saw that all these people were worshiping this God at the end of December, we said, well, you know, we want to help them understand who God really is, but we want them to understand that God, the God that we believe in, is a God of light. So we're going to pick a couple of days after the shortest day, and we're going to celebrate Jesus' birthday on the 25th, and we're going to say that as he came into the world, the light began to grow. You see how that happens? It, it was a theological reason. It wasn't a reason because we really knew when Jesus was born. We had to pick a day. I mean, he was born, right? Had to have a birthday sometime. Do we know what it is? No. So theologically, to teach people, let's pick the 25th, and from now on, Christmas is going to be on the 25th. That's the reason it was chosen. Not because we know for sure, but because it has a meaning. Okay? You understand that? All right. Um, so, let's read when... Y'all had a good answer for you. Let's read the first paragraph under the calendar of the church here. Somebody read the first paragraph. I'll read it. Okay. Um, the church here consists of two cycles of feasts and holy days. One is dependent on the... Uh, sorry dependent upon the movable date of Sunday of the Resurrection of Easter Day, the other upon the fixed date of December 25th, the Feast of Our Lord's Nativity or Christmas Day. Okay. So it's basically telling you that the days that we celebrate during the year in the church, some are fixed, like Christmas, and some move around. Somebody read the second paragraph. Okay. <laughs> Easter Day is always the first Sunday after the full moon that falls on or after March 21st. It cannot occur because before March 22nd or after April 25th. Okay. So Easter moves around every year, and it moves around based off of the first full moon that happens after the 21st of March. So the earliest Easter can be is March 22nd, Second. and the latest it can be is April 25th. 25th. Okay. Now, if Easter is on a movable day, then Ash Wednesday is also on a movable day because Ash Wednesday is always, you know, it's always 40 days before Easter. Okay, so Ash Wednesday moves, and Easter moves, and, and Pentecost moves, and all these other things move because they're all fixed upon what happens at Easter. Is Easter early or is Easter late? Uh, Pentecost always happens 50 days after Easter. And so those are things that move, and each, uh, Christmas and, and other things, such as baptism and Christmas, uh, baptism and Christ, those don't move. Right. You know, there's different types. 
Have you all heard of saints? Anybody know saints? Okay. In the Episcopal Church, we don't make saints. We don't, we don't find a, a wonderful person and then when they die say, well, let's make this person a saint. That would be me. Is what? That would be you? Okay. We'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Uh, the Roman Catholic Church makes saints, and I think the Greek Orthodox makes saints, but the, um, the Episcopal Church doesn't. What we do, though, is we recognize that some people have done wonderful things in our tradition. So look at page 19. Um, 19 lists all the people that we hold um, in spe special favor for the month of January. And if you look forward, February has, and, and March has, and so on and so forth. This is a full calendar. It, in, the, in the prayer book, it's not up to date because it was printed in 1970. We've added some people since. Find your birthday. See if there's anybody, anybody on there on your birthday. Anybody? Oh, Valentine, my birthday. My birthday Christmas Eve. It's when? Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, okay. Uh, well, I have something on there, but it doesn't have to do with the saints. So. What's it say? Um, it says Hilda, Abbess of Whitby, 680. Okay. Hilda was one of our early um, church mothers, and uh, she would teach people and she would write prayers and she would have visions. And so there's a very special day for her. November 18th. November 18th. And every year, November 18th, we, we read her story. If you were to come to church and we were doing morning prayer that morning, we would read her story and we would say, we're so happy that she was part of our history. Okay. So we have this, this calendar of important people in the life of the church. Some of these people were, you know, were put on this list as late as 1970. I mean, they had done things in their life that we wanted to remember. All right, so let's skip over the calendar, turn to page 37. I just to say, you, you, you said we don't make saints, but as I look at the list, some of these names have the word saint in front of them. And that's because Roman Catholic Church has designated them as a saint, and we acknowledge that. We recognize that. Okay. We recognize it, yeah. Okay. All right, um, page 37. What's the title of this? Daily Morning Prayer Rite 1. Morning, Daily Morning Prayer Rite 1. Now, if you turn a little bit further, You're going to find daily evening prayer right now. And you're going to find that on page 61. Okay? Morning and evening. We're going to come back to that one. All right? Turn to page 75. I want you to have your hand in um, page 37 and your hand in, in page 75. Now we have morning prayer right too. Okay. Somebody read under Advent. Somebody read the watch ye. Um, where's that? Oh. On page 37. Um, watch for you do not know. No, no, no. 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 On 37. On 37. I was yeah. wrong one. Watch ye for ye know not when to master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the clock crowing, or in the morning, lest suddenly he find you sleeping. All right. Somebody read the same paragraph on page 75. Watch, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or at the clock crowing, or in the morning. Lest he go suddenly and find you sleeping. Okay, I'll sleep. Same prayer? Yeah, yeah it's same just same like thing. easier to read the same. Okay. But the language is a little bit different. That's the difference between morning prayer right one and morning prayer right two is the language is a little bit different. And in some cases, when we get into like communion right one and right two, the words are actually a little bit different because there's a difference between uh, the feeling of the service. But right one is the old language. 
The right one is the language from the, the 1928 prayer book. And a lot of people love that, so rather than get rid of it, we decided to put it in here. And people who still love the 28 prayer book, we can do a service with that kind of language. And people who like the more modern language, we can do the right two, which has the, the current language. Morning prayer and evening prayer are things that the Episcopal Church says to you, these are for you. Every morning, if you want to be a really dedicated Episcopalian, every morning you can get up and take your prayer book and read through morning prayer just by yourself. And every evening before you go to bed, you read through evening prayer just by yourself. Or you all can do it as a family at home. What we have moved to is when we come to church on Sunday morning, we don't do morning prayer or evening prayer. We do communion. That's the community prayer. Okay, you see the difference? Okay. All right. So, um, I'm really, we really only have about 10 minutes left. Let me just point out that um, in the, um, in Holy Eucharist, we have the same thing. We have Holy Eucharist right one and right two. If you come to 8 o'clock service, you'll hear the right one language. Those are older people. They like that language. If you come to the 1030 service, you'll hear the right two language. And then um, right after communion, while well, we have the service for holy baptism, right after communion, we have um, prayers for people who are sick. And I'm going to ask you to turn the page um, 396. If there is somebody who is home and they cannot get to church anymore because they're too sick, uh, we have a communion that we keep in what we call the reserve, which is called, uh, in, in our church, is called the, uh, the ombre. It, the little red light that sits on the box, you all seen it as that light. That box has the blessed bread, the blessed, blessed wine. Somebody can come in if they've had the training. They can get some bread. They can get some wine. They can take it to somebody who's who's in their home, and they can read this communion for cir special circumstances, and they can give them the bread and the wine, and they can receive communion just like they were with us on Sunday morning uh, in the church. Now, um, turn to page four. 413. All right, here's the service for commun uh, confirmation. And um, that's what we're, I'm going to put it in the book, and everybody's going to read out of the book so that we all follow along with all the hymns and everything. And um, turn to page 418 when the, when the bishop comes. And you guys are all going to be sitting down front. Your name's going to be in the bulletin. Um, I'm going to present you all to the bishop. And then uh, one at a time, when it comes time for him to lay on hands, I will call you forward. And um, you can have your family and any friends that you want as you come forward. And we're going to walk through this later. But you'll kneel in front of the bishop. All your family and friends will be behind you. They can put their hands on your back. The bishop will lay hands on your head, and he will pray the prayer from 418. Well, I remember when that happened to David John. Do what? I remember when David John did that, my brother. You remember? And you yeah. came up, didn't you? I think so. Yeah. And the bishop will lay on hands, and he'll say, Strengthen, O Lord, your servant, Johnny, with your Holy Spirit, empower him. Him for your service, sustain him all the days of his life, and they will say amen. And then you'll stand up, and then somebody else will come up. And we've got about 24 people being confirmed. So this is going to be pretty cool, isn't it? Um, and then we'll do communion, and uh, part of what the Brotherhood does for you all is you will receive your own prayer book. Now it's going to be a little smaller than this, okay? It'll be your prayer book, it'll have your name in it. And the bishop will sign it. 
and it's yours for life. And it, it has everything that this has in it. It's just written a little smaller. <coughs> so that's your gift from the church um, when, when you're confirmed. Now, following um, communion is the service of holy matrimony, uh, which is on page 423. So if you want to get married and you want to you want a church service, this is the service we use. Okay. Following marriage is service of Thanksgiving for a child. That's on page 439. After you get married, you have children. That's a good thing. So we say, um, we say Thanksgiving to God for children. Um, after Thanksgiving, after Thanksgiving for a child, when you get married and you have children, then you start fighting. And on 447 is reconciliation. In the Roman Catholic Church, they call it confession. On Sunday morning, we all say the general confession. Uh, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart not loved our neighbors as ourselves. You all know that part? Okay. Well, sometimes when you've done something and you come on Sunday morning and you, you do the general confession, it still kind of still kind of bothers you a little bit. Well, if it still kind of bothers you, then you can come in, you can talk one-on-one -on -one with the priest, and you go through this little service, and the priest will tell you, all right, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to read this book, or I want you to pray this prayer, or whatever. And then the priest will remind you that you've been forgiven. Okay. Um, after reconciliation, uh, there's a little section with prayers in here about healing, about people being sick. And then um, on page 469, burial of the dead. Okay. And it's right one. And then we have burial of the dead right two. So again, the language is a little bit different. Okay. Any questions so far? So it's like the, it goes in order from like confirmation and marriage. Uh -huh. See, we have baptism first. You're born, you're baptized, you then it has communion. You get to receive communion. Then we have confirmation. Then we have marriage. Then we have children. Then we have fighting, reconciliation. Then we have dying. And so all these things just follow in order. And there's a service for all of these. So after burial, right one and right two, then uh, what you get into is what's called the Episcopal services. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in these. These are services that have been put in there to celebrate uh, making somebody a deacon. Brenda was just a deacon. So in order to make her a deacon, the bishop lays hands on her. There's a whole service to make someone a deacon. There's a whole service to make someone a bishop. There's a whole service to make someone a priest. And there's also a celebration for um, starting a new church with a new building and everything. So let's jump on past the new ministry and consecration of the church. And then what you're going to find here is it's called the Psalter. OK, uh, begins on page 582. Psalter is another way for saying psalms. All the psalms that are in the Bible are in our prayer book. Okay? So if I were to ask you to read Psalm 139, you would find 139 in here and we would read it together just like we do on Sunday morning. We're not going to do that right now. We'll push for time. Turn to page 810. Now we have the section for prayers. And um, 810, 811, 812, 813 give you a list of all the prayers that have been written and put in here. For example, we have prayers for young people, which is prayer number 47. So find 47 in here. God, our Father, you see our children growing up in an unsteady and confusing world. Show them that your ways give more life than the way of the world. 
and that following you is better than chasing after selfish goals. Help them to take the failure not as a measure of their worth, but as a chance for a new start. Give them strength to hold their faith in you and to keep alive their joy in your creation through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you are asked to give a prayer at school or uh, in some group and you're not really sure what to say, this is a really good place to come and start. And then you might use this, you might use a prayer that's in here word for word, which there's nothing wrong with, or you might take it and use some of it to make your own prayer. Okay. The rest uh, of the book is just like questions and answers. Yeah, um, that's called the Catechism. So, uh, it's called the Outline of the Faith. There's and, one for confirmation, I think. Yes, some priests take this back part, which is called the Catechism, and they go through it question by question. I don't, I don't do that. You're welcome to take, um, at any time, take a prayer book. And like I said, when you go through confirmation, you'll receive a prayer book. You can go through these questions and uh, answer them, and read through them and answer them um, with the answer that's right here. And if you have any questions, come and talk to me. Now, one in particular I do want to show you. Um, page 848. Bottom of the page, Sin and Redemption. Okay. The question is, what is sin? Somebody read the answer. Sin is the, seek sin is the seeking of our own will instead of the will of God. This distorting our relationship with God, with other people, and call creation. Okay. So sin is putting our will before God's will. God says that God wants us to um, take care of people who are poor. And if we choose not to do that and take all the money that we make and things like that and buy more stuff for ourselves, is that a sin? Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, and here's something that may be difficult for you to understand. It's difficult for adults to understand. Sometimes a sin, some, sometimes there's things that are a sin for me that may not, not be a sin for you, okay? Because what is God's will for me may not be what God's will is for you. You understand? Yeah. Um, it may be God's will that... Um, that I go to Africa and become a mis uh, missionary. And if I don't do that, that's a sin. But if you don't go to Africa and become a missionary, it's not necessarily sin because that may not be God's will for you. You understand? But we sometimes forget that um, God has different things. All right. This is going to, we're going to finish up here in about two minutes. Right after the Catechism is a section on historical documents. We're going to come back and read some of these later, but on page 864, at the top of the page, definition of the union of the divine and human natures of the person of Christ. That's the two natures of Jesus, fully human and fully divine. And then on page 866, remember I told you about the very first book of Common Prayer? On page 866, it tells you a little bit more if you ever want to read that. And the articles of religion are kind of like the, um, the things that, that the early Church of England uh, believed in, and they wrote them down so that everybody would know what we as the Episcopal Anglican Church, uh, what we believe and what we hold. Um, and then um, the last thing that we're going to look at are the tables and the lectionaries. Skip over the tables. Lectionary is on page um, 888. All right. I told you that at the beginning of the book there's morning prayer and there's evening prayer. And we ask you to do those at home. 
Now you read not only the prayers that are in the prayer book, but you also read scripture. In morning prayer, you read some scripture. You read the Old Testament and the New Testament. In evening prayer, you read the gospel. In both of them, you read the Psalms. So this is called the Revised Lectionary. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over the Lectionary. If you look, I apologize for this. If you look at page 936, 936 tells you what readings you're supposed to do every day. Okay. So, there's year one and you, there's year two. Year one, um, if like next year's is 2017, it's an odd number. So beginning in Advent, which was last Sunday, we're starting to move into year one. So if, if I'm going to read morning prayer today, um, I would go to Saturday on page 936, Saturday under week one Advent, and it would tell me that the Psalms that I'm going to read for morning prayer are 20 and 21, those verses, and I'm going to read Isaiah, and I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians. And then in evening prayer, I'm going to read Psalm 110, and I'm going to read the Gospel of Luke. Now, you'll notice that you have year one, year two, so you do one, year one, and then when you finish year one, you do year two, and then when you finish year two, you go back to year one, and you just keep doing this. Here's the interesting thing. If you do morning prayer and evening prayer every day for two years, you will have read about 90% of the Bible. And you don't have to pick up the Bible and read from the beginning to the end. You just read it this way. All right, turn back to uh, 889, where I had you before. Eight eighty nine is what we read on Sunday morning. It's called the lectionary. The, the morning prayer stuff is called the daily order. This is called the lectionary. So we are in year A. Um, year A is mostly Matthew. So all this year, you're going to hear us read mostly after out of Matthew. Occasionally you're going to hear us read out of John. Year A is Matthew, year B is Mark, year 3 is Luke, and John is used at times throughout all three years. So, Sunday's reading, what would be the Gospel? You're on page 888, second Sunday of Advent, the Gospel would be what? Matthew 3. Matthew 3, 1 through 12. Okay. Now, that's everything in our prayer book. It's an awful lot. And uh, it's more than just that little crease of material that we see on Sunday morning. There are prayers in here for everything. Um, and it, it, the wonderful thing about the prayer book is, and this will be my final point, and then we're going to take a break. wonderful thing about the prayer book is, because all of the churches use them, if you go to California and you wake up on Sunday morning, your family says, hey, let's go to church, and you go to an Episcopal church, what, are you going to, what kind of service are you going to get? The one you've seen. The one that you've already seen. <laughs> you can go to a church that you've never been to, and they're going to start with an opening hymn. They're going to start with the acclamation, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And everybody's going to say, blessed be his kingdom now and forever. And you're going to have scripture reading, and you're going to have confession, and you're going to have the creed, and you're going to have communion, and it's all going to be the same, just like you were here. Okay. Having worshipped in several Episcopal churches, so I'll warn you, if you go, you've got to pay attention to the kneeling and the standing, because different ones do them different ways. Yeah. <laughs> we stand during the prayers of the people. Some churches kneel during the prayers of the people. So the little things like that you have. All right. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. Um, Take a break, eat some more donuts, go to the bathroom. What kind of what kind of flavor is the contributor? Uh, it's it's a combination of ginger ale and um, grape juice. You can have water or you can go downstairs, there's some soda. If you all want soda, you're more than happy to get soda. I just didn't want to love 15 bottles of soda upstairs. So I'm going to go get some, um, some
some things to bring up for our next. We're going to talk about the Bible.